Welcome to another Sunday School. It's an uh, online edition. This week we're doing First and Th Second Thessalonians. Let's open in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your ability to study your word. Help us to come to know it more fully, so that we may be fully equipped for every good work. And we may know uh, the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go over our scripture memorization for this quarter. Galatians 3.10 For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Ephesians 2, verses 8-10 through 10, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Titus 3, 4 through 5. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So, where is Thessalonica, where the Thessalonians were? That is in the Macedonia area, which is, uh, I think that is kind of northern Greece. Remember, Ephesus is the main hub of, uh, of uh, Paul's activity in Asia, in modern-day Turkey. And Thessalonica is up here if you remember from acts uh there was a lot of persecution from the jewish community there so they had to flee to berea and the bereans were known for how they were different from the Jew the jewish community in berea was different from the jewish community in thessalonica in that they tested they were open-minded and tested the uh the paul's message against scripture which is always a good thing. Always test anybody's message, even mine, against Scripture. And they were commended for that. So there were P Jewish uh, believers and Gentiles who did believe in Thessalonica, and they were under a lot of persecution. So this is one of the things uh, that you need to keep in mind in the background here. So... They were commended for their faith. They were standing strong, but they were the the believers in Thessalonica were coming under persecution, and they were also having to deal with false teaching about the return of Jesus. So we're just going to highlight uh, that theme in terms of uh, what Paul tells us about the return of Jesus. That's the main thing we're going to go with or, or try to highlight today. Not saying that's the only thing, so as always, please, uh, I recommend reading the whole thing. We're, we're, just, we're just doing the main, main things we want to teach you, but there's, as anything in Scripture, there's deep riches in all of this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That means dead. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring those who have fallen asleep. Well, God, uh, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So when Jesus comes back, those who have died will come with him and be resurrected. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel. It's like a head angel. That's what the ark uh, means there. And with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are, left, uh, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, 
encourage one another with these words. Why is this encouraging? Because God's coming back. People who have died, or if we die before, we will be resurrected. And that's our great hope. All right. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 2. So in the next chapter... Now, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to take anything written, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, a day of judgment in the Old Testament is always considered a day of the Lord. And when Jesus returns, that will be a day of judgment. Judge, uh, he will judge whether we he we are in him or we are outside of him. And will come like a thief in the night. This sounds a lot like what we hear in the Gospels, right? No one will know the hour. Uh, if you knew the thief was coming uh, you, in that parable, I believe that's in, I, it's at least in Matthew. So no one knows when the Lord is coming back. And it's going to just come suddenly. Like, no one's going to be expecting it. All right. Second Thessalonians. Since God considers it... Oh, well, what we're going over here is what the final judgment will be like. Since God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, so they're under persecution. Those who are being persecuted and don't repent are in for a bad time. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey his gospel. Now I want to look at something here. Uh... So we, we say believe or disbelieve, but when and you don't believe the gospel, that's the go, believing is also a command. So we see that described as not obeying the gospel. So you might uh, just don't be confused by that language. That's the same way when you don't when you don't believe, you're also disobeying. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. So what does eternal destruction mean? It means away from the, you're not in the presence of the Lord. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who believed. So he, he's glorified in us and our outcome. And how do we worship him? How, how is he glorified? By us marveling at him. Because our testimony to you was believed. So believing the gospel glorifies God. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. So that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the errors because that he's trying to fix here is that the th because Jesus was coming back, and, and again, he had to tell him, like, hey, you don't know when. But one of the other things is, is that people just quit their jobs and stopped working because, hey, Jesus is coming back. <coughs> Excuse me. So Paul is trying to correct that. So we have a war, as the title says here, warning against idleness, not working. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. In other words, you execute, I think this is a command for excommunication. To say, hey, I, I, you are in disobedience. You just quit your job. You're not even trying to work. Uh, no, you can't do that. For Paul wants them to imitate them. 
the him and his uh, uh, co-workers because they were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, even though they had the right to do that. All right. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. So if you are able to work and you don't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be given handouts. So if someone's not working and they say, hey, could you please give me some food? And they're intentionally not working. It's not like they have, it's, they broke a leg and can't walk or something like that. They just quit up and quit their job. Paul doesn't want you to give them food. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now so, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. <coughs> Excuse me again. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. This is a very good message. Don't grow, just keep at doing good. Don't let it wear you down. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed so he can correct himself, right? That's why. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. So maybe it wasn't excommunication in mind, but definitely they, Paul wants this problem fixed. So what should you do? You should plant a tree. Why should you plant a tree? So people 50 years from now can enjoy the tree, even though you aren't. What would you be doing to what should you be doing today if Jesus is coming back? You should be doing the same thing if Jesus was coming back tomorrow or 10 years from now or 100 years from now. So be rich in good works, preach the gospel, care for the poor and the widow, the orphan and the widow and the poor and 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 fellowship and worship. That's do just do your thing. So uh, that's, I think, the basic message of uh, Thessalonians. Jesus coming back. We should look forward to it. Keep doing good. Keep doing good works. And living for the Lord as if he weren't coming back today. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to fix our hope on Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we will have resurrected bodies and that you will come to judge the living and the dead. Help us to view that as marvelous. Help us to glorify you in our, our belief and in our obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.